Let's just uh, go back to the beginning. In Genesis chapter 3 is where we'll begin this morning. You know, while I was uh, in, I guess it was graduate school, uh, my wife and I uh, sometimes would uh, take a day trip and we would travel to North Carolina. And uh, there is a particular area that we liked. Uh, Cherokee, North Carolina, I think was the name of the area. Maggie Valley. And one of the things that I remember about that place is that uh, there were places where you could uh, pay uh, a price and go into an area and hunt for gemstones. Did you know that you could find gemstones in North Carolina? In fact, the gem that North Carolina uh, uh, says is their state gem is the emerald. Uh, we never did that, but uh, people have found some very valuable precious stones uh, in that area of North Carolina in the, in the mountains. In fact, uh, I read of a man who back in 1990 in the area of Asheville, Connecticut, which is mountainous, he was hunting for gemstones and he found three star rubies. What is a star ruby? Uh, it's a reddish purplish uh, gemstone, but it also has a white star uh, on the top of it, but this one, these were so unique that not only did they have a white star on the top, but also on the bottom. And uh, he and his family tried to uh, sell them, couldn't find anyone to pay the price that these uh, gemstones were worth. He uh, recently uh, passed away, and his family decided to uh, give these gemstones uh, to an auctioneer here in New York City and they're estimated to probably bring about 90 million dollars. Three, three gemstones, uh, star rubies. Um, I, I, you can see them online. I was thinking about that in relationship to what the Bible says. This Bible is like a field that is just filled with treasures. And uh, the writer of Proverbs, Solomon, he said that if you want the treasure that, are, that is found in the minds of God's Word, you have to search for it as, as a silver. You have to treasure it like a gem. One year ago, approximately, we began studying the book of Genesis, and I finally finished it last week. And we found, I think, a lot of precious gems of truth. I would uh, venture to say that the gem of all gems, of course, is God himself. And it all begins and it ends with him. In fact, when you open the Bible, and when you open the book of Genesis, it simply begins this way, in the beginning God. There is no introduction. There is no argument for his existence. There is no speculation about him. But here he is. He is the gem of all gems, not only in the book of Genesis, but in the entire scripture and in the entire universe. He is the all-wise, all-knowing being in our universe. He is the all-powerful uh, to which nothing, nothing is impossible and nothing is too hard for him. He is the Holy One, as we heard about this morning in the Torah time. He is holy. He is of purer eyes and they behold iniquity. He can't stand to look on sin. He is a God that is just and because he is just he has no alternative but to punish evil. He is a God thankfully that is also gracious and even though no human being deserves his love and forgiveness because of his graciousness, he bestows upon us a tender love that just keeps uh, becoming more and more precious as we draw near to him. 
He is a God that is absolutely sovereign over everything. He, he moves in what is called by theologians providential ways. That is, that God's powerful hand is in everything. And that is a major emphasis in all the events and all of the people and characters that you find in the book of Genesis and in the Bible as a whole. However, even though God is that, even though God providentially, sovereignly is in every aspect of our human lives, then and now, and of course forever, it doesn't negate nor does it diminish the personal responsibility that every single human being had and has and will have to be responsible before God. You look at the characters' lives in the book of Genesis and you'll find that uh, what happened was a result of them of either ignoring or following God's plan for their life. And you know what? There are results that come from ignoring God's plans, and they're not good ones. But there are also blessings that uh, follow when we pay attention to God's plan and we're interested in His purposes. If you haven't lately, if you're a believer, you ought to see God's hand in your life long before you ever believed. But if you haven't done that lately, if you haven't thought back, thought about it, you should. You should see God's hand behind all of your history, however long you have lived to this point. It's the God who made you, and he made you for himself. He brought you to where you are, and he promises you a wonderful future. So there are many important truths many significant gems of truth in the book of Genesis, but I just want to boil it down and share three with you this morning as we kind of touch the highlight of our study of the book of Genesis to end it out. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that we can come into your presence. We thank you that you are the true and living eternal God. We thank you, as we've just uh, mentioned, that you are in sovereign control of all human events, even when it looks like our country or our world is spinning out of control. You have a plan for planet Earth, and I'm thankful, Lord, and we pray, may your will be done, and it will, but may your will be done. That is, may we cooperate with you to see your will accomplished on this earth in the days that we have here. Lord, open our eyes and show us the simple truth and yet the, the overarching significant truth in these uh, three things that we want to pull out of the book of Genesis now this morning. And may it all redound to your glory, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I've had you turn to Genesis chapter 3 on purpose because in those first seven verses you have the first gem that you must understand in order to get the rest of the book and have it make sense. And that truth is this. It's the truth of man's fallenness. Man's fallen. And you have here the record of Adam and Eve disobeying God's one command. And really, as you look around and become disappointed at things in your own life, in your family's life, in, in the city, in this country, in the world, it can all be traced back to this chapter. Sin is the thing that, uh, that is responsible for all the problems that we have and have had. When you think of it, Human life began in a beautiful garden. But if you remember last week, the book of Genesis begins in a garden, but it ends in a coffin. You have Joseph being buried in a coffin, it says in that ending of chapter 50. 
what went wrong. It starts with a beautiful creation, man made in God's own image, and then finishes with this disturbing conclusion of man being eaten up and engulfed by death. What happened? Man's fallen. Truth number one. Which, of course, brings us to our memory verse in chapter 3 and verse 15. Look at it with me right now. You have your Bible open. And let's read verse 15 together, if you would, please. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Here in the book of Genesis, we get a graphic portrayal of really the devastating effects of sin on humanity, but also a picture of God's mercy. And his mercy is first seen here in that he promises to provide redemption for mankind. He's talking to Satan in that 15th verse, the serpent that, uh, that Satan used to deceive the woman and of, and, of course, bring the downfall of her husband as well, Adam. How does this get pictured. Yet in this third chapter, I want to show you this. He's talking about a future. This is a prophecy in verse 15, that there is going to be an individual, a human being, that must be miraculously created because he is going to be the, he's going to be the offspring of a woman's seed, and women don't have the seed. They have the egg, right? But this individual is going to be the result of the woman's seed. In other words, here is an individual that would be created without the help of a man. It would be an individual that would be brought forth through a virgin birth. That's the first hint of a virgin birth there in that 15th verse of Genesis chapter 3. And of course, the prophecy is that in the, uh, in the process of this Redeemer and this redemption that he will uh, provide, there will be a hurting of the Redeemer. His heel will be bruised, which is not really a deadly wound, is it, your heel? But on the other hand, the head of the serpent or Satan will be crushed. And the reason the heel of the Redeemer will be bruised is because the head of the serpent will be crushed under the heel of the Redeemer, the Messiah. This is a wonderful prophecy. This is redemption. This is God's answer to man's fallen. It's redemption. It begins with this prophecy here, but it is pictured for us, I think, wonderfully, if you have the eyes to see it, in the 21st verse. Chapter 3, verse 21. Unto Adam, and also to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Question for you. When Adam and Eve sinned, and their innocence was banished, and they hid themselves there among the trees in the garden because they were conscious for the first time of their nakedness, what did they do to try to cover their nakedness? They wove together some fig leaves to cover their nakedness. Here, later on, in this 21st verse, it's as if, the implication is, is, is it, it is as if God says, look, your fig leaves aren't going to cut it. Your fig leaves are not going to do. I'm going to take upon myself the responsibility to provide you a proper and adequate covering. 
what this first of all says to us, it's a picture of redemption. It's a picture of salvation that the, the Lord gives to us here. And the first point is this. Every human being has a need for covering. Every human being has a need for covering. We stand in the glaring light of God's holy presence with all of our sinfulness exposed. You can't cover it by any good work that you can perform, by any fig leaf that you might think that you can pull up around yourself. Now, this is humorous, and I, I'm not trying to make you laugh, but it is humorous. I've had a couple of times in my life as a preacher dreams where I would, uh, I would be in a place to preach and I would be in my underwear <laughs> instead of my suit. And I would be horrified. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I was glad when I woke up it was a dream. <laughs> Maybe it was, uh, you know, when I had opportunity to preach at, at uh, maybe a, a, a more uh, larger venue or whatever. But anyway, I don't know what, uh, what brought that on. But look, as embarrassing as that might be, that is nothing. That is nothing to compare with the fact that you and I stand morally and spiritually naked before God. There is absolutely nothing that can cover our nakedness. He knows us inside and out for who we really are. We never fool him one iota. There's a need for covering that scene in this passage, in this picture. But there's a second thing that I see in this illustration of God providing them these coats of skin. There is also that fact, of course, that self-covering is inadequate. Man-made redemption never is acceptable to God. You can't uh, work it up. You can't work it out yourself. You have to come God's way if you want to be saved. It's not some way that a priest or a rabbi or an imam tells us to be right, that we can be right with God. It's not some way that a, that, a, that a minister tells us. It's what God says. And there's only one way. You cannot provide it. No human being can provide it for him or herself. It's not a man-made way. Self-covering is, is inadequate. It requires a Messiah who sacrifices himself as a savior, as a substitute for mankind's atonement. Here's a third truth that's seen in that 21st uh, verse that I want to pull out and show you today, and that is that uh, God alone is capable of covering us. God alone is capable of covering our spiritual nakedness and guess what just as he did here without being asked God takes the initiative in this and he provides it all salvation God takes the initiative it's been available it's been available all along God takes the initiative he provides it all he makes it available to all as well that's the truth of a savior, of a messiah. But then one, uh, I think perhaps even the most important thought from this 21st verse is this, that this redemption, this covering, it required a substitutionary death. It required the death of an animal to substitute for their death in order to cover them. That's very important. Adam and Eve, at this point, witnessed the first death ever in the world. When God cut the throats or whatever he did to provide these animal skins for their covering, that must have been shocking to them. They never witnessed death before. And yeah, it was the death of the animal. You know, and I'm sure you could get used to butchering animals, cutting, you know, killing animals. I'm sure you get used to that. But this is the first time. This must have been terribly shocking, and it must have shown them the seriousness of sin. 
sin is very serious. It causes the death of an innocent substitute. And as a result, then, uh, it also shows the depths of God's grace, doesn't it? It also indicates the necessity of the shedding of blood of an innocent substitute. These animals were butchered in order, and skinned in order for Adam and Eve to be covered adequately. God did it. And that's exactly the picture of what Calvary is about. The redemption that any believer enjoys in Jesus is the result of Jesus being that innocent substitute that took your sin in his body on that tree, that paid your sin debt in full, who shed his blood instead of you having to shed your blood he shed his blood as the payment price. He poured out his life instead of you having to pour out your life because your life would be an insufficient payment. But he is the son of God. And he provides the covering through a, the death of a substitute, he being our substitute. It's called substitutionary atonement. Man's fallen. And that's what this plan of redemption is all about. But you know what? It doesn't end the moment you trust Christ as your Savior. Thankfully, it continues throughout your whole life and into eternity. There's an aspect of redemption that is called by theologians sanctification, and it hits on that same Hebrew verb that uh, was talked about here in our Torah time. That sanctification, holy separate, severed from that which is unholy, set, us, set apart from all that is evil. But you know what? Man is fallen. And even though man is redeemed, he has not yet been totally glorified. And so this whole lifetime that we have on this earth we are going through a process called sanctification where he is progressively setting us apart more and more and more as his. Yeah. Think about it. These men in the book of Genesis, they had relationships with God, but they were far from perfect. They are fraught with... Uh, with self, life, and problems. Remember Abraham? Uh, listened to his wife. He thought he'd take matters into his own hand and he'd do an end around God uh, in order to fulfill God's promise his own way. And he took this uh, handmaid of his wife Sarah, Hagar. And what a problem that caused. We're still suffering the consequences of that to this very day. How about uh, Isaac? Isaac, he seems like a gentleman, but you know, Isaac, he had his flaws too. Isaac uh, showed favoritism to Esau, and Esau was not the one that God planned to carry on the, the line that Messiah would come through. But Esau was stubborn about it because he had a selfish interest in choosing his, his son Esau instead of Jacob because he liked Esau. He liked what Esau could provide for him. That's a problem. There's some work that needs to be done in, in that man's life. How about Jacob? <laughs> his very name is a, is a clue to what kind of a character he was. He was a schemer. He was a conniver. He was a deceiver and a cheater. Jacob. But thankfully, God worked in this man and made him an Israel, right? And how about uh, his brothers? His ten brothers, anyway. They sold their very brother as a slave because they were jealous of him, because they envied him, and thus they hated him. And so they sell him as a slave. But yet God's purposes in all of these men's lives, in all of these 
Genesis Bible characters' lives. God's purposes, his plan goes forward despite their sinful flaws. Listen, human beings are messed up. All of us. Human beings are messed up. We are works in progress. And we must learn to depend upon God so that we can experience God's grace in our lives. Jacob knew it when he was a rascal. He knew it when he needed God so desperately that night when he was going to meet his brother Esau after 20 years in which Esau had uh, been uh, plotting to kill him early on. He pled and prayed to God and he said, Oh Lord, I'm not worthy of the least bit of your mercies and your truth which you have shown your servant. He got it. But at the same time, he had a lot yet to be sanctified. You know what? Fact of the matter is, that's the reason that I don't give up on anybody. That's the reason why you and I shouldn't give up on people. Because God sees them as a work in progress. And so we try to take people where they are and by the power and grace of God, bring them along to where they're supposed to be. But you and I can't bring anyone any farther than we ourselves are. We don't give up on I'm thankful that God doesn't give up on me. I'm thankful that God doesn't give up on you. We could go back to Romans chapter 8 and, and we know that all things work together for good to them who love God, who are the called according to his purpose. How do we know that all things work together for good? For believers. Well, the next verse says, because whom God did foreknow, he also predestined that they would be conformed to the image of his dear son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Do you get it? In other words, if you are a believer, you are in the process of being changed. Now you can throw your monkey wrench into the cog, you can throw your, your selfishness into the gears and, uh, and try to mess things up. God knows how to deal with us. We are a work in progress, and God is seeking to sanctify us because you know what he sees? He sees us as already glorified. Whom he called, he justified. Whom he justified, he glorified. Made in his image. Yeah. So, folks, man's fallen. That's, that's the first truth that I take is a, a gem. You say, how is fallenness a gem? It's because of what it brought forth. That great redemption and plan of sanctification that is at work. Here's the second truth, and for this, I apologize, but I'm going to take you uh, to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, because it's about people in the book of Genesis, but I want you to hear the writer of Hebrews take on it. So Hebrews chapter 11, got that? Hebrews 11 is the what chapter? The faith chapter. You know, we uh, in sporting events, we have a hall of fame. Well, here's, here's God's hall of fame, so to speak. And they are heroes of the faith because what they did, they did by faith, by dependence upon God. Okay. Hebrews 11, I want you to look with me at verse 13. And let's read them together. Verse 13 down through verse 16. Ready? These all died in faith. Now hold it a minute. Who? Oh, Abraham, uh, you know, uh, all, all the patriarchs. These all died in faith, having not received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them, that is the promises, and embraced them, that is God's promises, and confessed that they were, notice this terminology, strangers and what? Strangers and pilgrims, don't forget that, strangers and pilgrims. They confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims where? On this earth, strangers and pilgrims. 
Why? Verse 14. For they, read with me, they say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly one. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Now we know that city to be called, in Revelation chapter 22, New Jerusalem, don't we? Yeah. 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 Here's the second uh, gem from Genesis, and it's this. Life's a pilgrimage. Life's a pilgrimage. All of these patriarchs in Genesis considered themselves nothing but strangers and pilgrims. Strangers are people that are away from their home. Pilgrims are people that are headed for their home. Strangers and pilgrims. And we as believers need to consider ourselves to be both. Strangers away from home, the New Jerusalem, and pilgrims heading home. We're heading home. That's our real, that is what the life of faith is all about. That is a faith life. That's walking by faith. It's recognizing that you are not at home. You're on a pilgrimage. You're on a journey. Your whole life is a pilgrimage. Don't get, don't drive the tent stakes too deep because it is just a tent. Your body is a tent and tents aren't permanent. Tents are meant to be taken up and, and carried off at, at any given time. So this is a temporary residence that we have. Why do we act as if this is all there is? Like this is the most important. Not at all. Not at all. We're strangers and we're pilgrims. You know what? That idea that these patriarchs had in the book of Genesis of being strangers and pilgrims, that life's a pilgrim, that's a mindset. That is a mindset that recognizes, again, that this world is not your home. This isn't home. What your address is, that's not really your home. It's a temporary residence, actually. That's all it is. This body is really not your permanent home. It's a temporary residence. You're going to get a new one that's going to be permanent. And you're not going to have backaches or headaches or COVID-19 or anything. <laughs> yeah. It's an attitude. You're not home yet. You're traveling. You're not settling. You're traveling. Keep that mindset in your life. You're a traveler. You're not a settler. Because your spiritual eyes are on the future New Jerusalem that's your permanent home. And you're just, uh, you're, you're, just, uh, you're just passing through. That's why we sang those choruses at the end. This world's not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Right? You're just, hey, pass that vision on to your children and your grandchildren. Pass that vision on to others. Life's a pilgrimage. Where are you headed? You ever get the feeling that this life's temporary? You wonder if you really belong here? You ever have that feeling as a believer? Have your eyes ever had that faraway look where you long for heaven? It happens when you get really sick. It happens when you lose someone you really love. Which world are you living for anyway? Are you ready for the life to come? The world to come? Have you prepared for that? Let me ask this question that uh, I had, uh, I came across in my reading. Are the things that you are living for right now worth Christ dying for? Repeat that. Are the things that you are living for worth Christ dying for? It's an attitude. It's a mindset. Life's a pilgrimage. And along with that, it's an advance as well as an attitude. There's no coasting through the Christian life. 
we're going somewhere. We're either making progress or we're sliding back. When you stand still in your faith life, you've ceased being a pilgrim. There's always new promises to claim. There's always new victories to gain. You know what the abundant Christian life really is? It is a series of new beginnings in which you never arrive and you never think you have arrived. If you think you've arrived, you've proved you haven't. Even Paul said, those things that were gained to me, I count as loss. He says, things that are behind, I forget them. And I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I count not myself to have apprehended, Paul said. In other words, I have not arrived. Mm -hmm. Philippians 3. I mean, he said that at the end uh, of his life, basically. Life's a pilgrimage. Don't you get that from the book of Genesis? A lot of those patriarchs are tent dwellers. There's more to it. They, were, they weren't staying put. They were moving. Moving around. Because they weren't in their final home yet. You would think that their final home would be Canaan. But no. Hebrews tells us they were looking for something better than that. They were looking for something better than what they left behind. And even better than Canaan. A heavenly city. A new Jerusalem third and final gem that I want to share with you as we close. I think that the book of Genesis really highlights the family. I think it tells us that family is central. Man's fallen. Life's a pilgrimage. Family central. I want you to go back with me to Genesis chapter 12. And in that 12th chapter, There we find, again, our memory verse, but also uh, Abraham, as he is called by God to leave Ur of the Chaldees. He said, get out of your country, get away from your relatives, uh, go to a land that you don't know, but I'm going to show you when the time comes, and in that land, I'm going to make you a great nation, and I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to make you, your name great, and I'm, uh, and you're going to be a blessing to people. In fact, I'm going to bless you so much that through you, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. Wow. What a significant... But families are central. God created families. It's not a mistake that we grew up in families. God created families, and really, the breakdown of the family brings about societal collapse. That's where we're, we're headed. The breakdown of family will cause society to collapse. Divorce devastates the family. I remember when I was a child, the worst thing that could happen to a husband and a wife is that they would divorce. Now it's no big deal. Now it's expected. Divorce devastates the family. That's never been God's plan. Abortion kills the family. And we have murdered, murdered unborn babies and some born babies. We've killed the family. Transgenderism, homosexuality, same-sex marriage, that destroys the family. God's against it and that's the reason I'm against it. Because the family is central in God's plan. He's the one that came up with the idea of marriage and children. It's all God's plan. Genesis, the book, hinges on a family. Here in the call of Abraham in chapter 12, God's plan of redemption is all caught up in the calling of Abraham who would become a family that would become a nation through which the Redeemer would uh, come and then redemption would flow to all earth's families. And he puts the solitary in families, the psalmist says. In the second chapter of Genesis in verse 24, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife 
and the two shall be one flesh. Family central, and central to family is marriage, as God defines it, monogamous. One man, one woman that are bound together for life. You know, I sometimes chuckle at the, uh, the grounds for divorce that Christians, preachers, and theologians always come up with. And uh, often they use the same passages of Scripture in order to prove their point. And one of the most uh, uh, frequently used is 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And they talk about uh, the grounds uh, of divorce based on uh, unfaithfulness or desert uh, desertion by the, uh, the unsaved spouse. The whole thing, the whole subject is uh, summed up and the whole question is answered in the 39th verse when Paul finishes the subject. Here it is. Ready for it? The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will only in the Lord. That's the final word on it. Okay? Basically, he says this. Marriage is for life. There's no loopholes. It's for life. It's a lifelong bond of one man with one woman. Hey, I know we live in a world where that's passe. And maybe you messed up in that area. Well, guess what? You can repent and you can remove you can move forward with God. And he can still use you. And he can still bless you. And he can still work in you and through you. And I want you to know that. Marriage. The marriage is not just so that husband and wife can dwell together alone. Marriage is to bring forth a heritage. From a marriage to a heritage. 127th Psalm. Children. Children are the heritage of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward. Blessed is the man that hath his quiver full of them, that is of children. Why? Because they are the heritage of the Lord. This is where God gets his heritage through children that come out of marriage. Not only material possessions are a heritage that we pass on to our children, but a status that can be passed down to them, a godly heritage to our descendants. And guess what? It doesn't automatically happen. It's a result of godly parenting. And I'm not saying perfect parenting. There isn't any such thing. But I'm saying consistent godly parenting. That's how it happens. That's how you have a heritage. That's how you have something to pass down. A consistent walk with the Lord. That's the thing. A consistent walk with the Lord. A consistent advance in the life of faith. That's exactly what Joseph shows us as we get to the end of the book in the 50th chapter where we ended last week. I want you to note uh, just a couple of verses. In verse 24 and 25, of Genesis chapter 50. Joseph said to his brethren, I die, and God shall surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto the land which he sware to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, his brothers, saying, God will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones from hence. That's a heritage he's leaving. It's a, it's, here's a man of faith. He's saying, God is surely going to visit you and care for you. And he is going to bring you out of this land. He's going to bring you out of Egypt to the land that he promised to our forefathers. At the very point of death, he is pointing his family to the living God. God's going to visit you. I don't know, but I think about my deathbed. If I have one, maybe I won't have a deathbed. Maybe it'll be an instant uh, passing. I don't know. God, that's all in his 
in his care. But I want to, if I have a deathbed experience, I want to have the opportunity to pass on to my children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren if I live that long. And if I have the opportunity, I want them to know what Jacob wanted his family to know, that God is going to visit you. And you need to look to him. And you need to depend upon him. You need to believe him. Here's a man of faith. God's going to do this for you. At the point of death, he's, he's concerned about spiritual things, God's things. And he becomes a witness to God's promised deliverance on his deathbed. And so Genesis ends in a note of hope. God is going to visit Israel, and he did, not right away, but he did. It's called the Exodus, right? It's called Pesach, the Passover. God visited just as Joseph said he would. What kind of a heritage are you planning on leaving your family? Got anything in mind? Have you planned that out yet? Have you thought about that very deeply? It begins by you modeling a godly walk with the Lord now. That you are consistent every day, day in and day out. And when you mess up, you admit it openly. And you ask forgiveness for your sinfulness. And they see, yeah, he's a man. He's flawed, but he loves God. I read a story about a man that was walking along the beach one day just at dawn, and he noticed a, a boy ahead of him, and that boy was picking up starfish that were in the sand, and he was flinging them out uh, into the waves. And he caught up with the, with the boy, and he said, what are you doing? And he said, well, all these starfish are stranded on the beach, and they're going to die when the morning sun comes up. And the man said, but you know, look, the beach goes on for miles. There are millions of starfish on the beach. How can, how can any effort that you have make a difference? And the boy looked at the starfish that he already had in his hand. He said, it makes a difference to this one. <laughs> and he threw it into the waves. You may think that your life, you may think that your family make little difference in the big scheme of things even in this city that seems to swallow us up and give us no voice as believers. But I want to tell you, it makes a huge difference in the life of that person, that neighbor, that coworker, that family member, whose life you are impacting and you are bringing Jesus to them. Has God laid perhaps someone on your heart that he is telling you, you need to go talk to that person about me? You need to go, how do I do it, Lord? That's what you ask. And he says, I'll show you. And maybe he puts a thought in your mind. Oh, on Mother's Day or near Mother's Day, go get a little plant and, uh, and, and take that plant and knock on that neighbor's door and tell them that God sent you. And uh, he put uh, them on your heart and you wanted to show them. And that could be perhaps the entrance to tell them about Jesus. That's what God wants to do with us as individuals, with us as families. He wants us to have that kind of an impact because man's fallen and life's a pilgrimage and family's central. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity that we've had today to just look in these chapters of Genesis one last time before we go to another book. We pray that you might use it mightily. Let us not forget these truths, but let us meditate on them and the profitability of that meditation appear to all in Jesus' name. Amen.